and welcome back. And we are now at part three of this week's new comics, bitches! So getting right back into it. Uh, so we're kind of moving on to our uh, independent portion. Uh, so the first thing that we're going to talk about is uh, Angel and Faith, season nine, uh, number seven. So... Uh, again, Christmas Gage still uh, writing the hell out of it. Uh, you know, Rebecca Isaac still drawing the hell out of it. And basically, what we have here is that we had something that was a big shock at the finale of the previous issue was that Drusilla is not only back, but she is sane. So that conceivably makes her you know, even more deadly than when she was insane. So definitely somebody you want to watch out for there. But um, basically we find out the, you know, the kind of cure to her insanity. And again, now, one thing that this particular issue lacks that it did not have in uh, that, the, you know, this uh, particular issue lacks that it, uh, that it had in the previous issue was the uh, kind of, you know, looking over the past of Robert Giles and the relationship that he had with his father. Because ultimately the arc itself is called Daddy Issues. And what we're dealing with here, of course, is that Drusilla is the, you know, daughter, if you will, of, uh, of Angel. Uh, also, we talk a little bit about, we don't see, but we talk a little bit about Connor. Uh, we talk about Angel's son. And then, of course, we have the uh, uh, we have the emergence of Face Father, and you know who seems like you know we, we see a little bit of where uh, she came from, as far as you know what her background was like, and you know there's a lot of talk about uh, Drusilla wanting to basically you know take the pain away from Angel so that he can stop constantly torturing himself. Uh, so there is actually, it, it seems like the, despite the fact that she has no soul, that she is uh, you know, that she's still f feels this affection for him as a father figure. And we have, you know, Faith's, you know, semi-reconciliation with her own father but we also have these uh, you know we have these revelations that uh, possibly could have long-running ramifications for how they you know how things go or at least for the for the meantime anyway so but wow I mean just this is really, you know, it's really hitting its stride now. Uh, you know, this this arc has been really, really strong so far. I'm really happy that it's uh, that it's going this way, and not, you know, kind of just kind of resting on its laurels. You know, just kind of carrying on under the name of, uh, you know, with you know, kind of the Joss Whedon label, uh, because that can be a very, it's kind of a difficult and ultimately a stupid move to make when you're dealing with these kind of things. You've got to consistently make it fresh. You've got to consistently make it interesting. It has to be like if Joss was writing it himself. And that is one thing I do wonder, though, is you know how much uh, kind of input he does. I'm sure that he has a lot of input on the storylines himself, because after all, this is his created universe. But, you know, exactly how much input he has in the storytelling. Uh... Because, you know, Christmas Gage uh, doesn't really bring the funny quite as much as Whedon can. But he definitely has a really, really solid grip on these characters and, you know, doesn't waste any time with, uh, you, know, oh, you know, too much exposition or too much, you know, just unrelated nonsense, if you will. Which I'm finding some of in... Buffy right now, so there's that. Uh, but uh, you know, again, with the combination of Gage, you know, like I said, it's just it lacked a little bit of the same emotional punch that the previous issue did. 
but still very interesting, very compelling. Angel always was, you know, not quite as funny as Buffy was. So, like, you know, like I said, I, you know, I, I have, you know, I have very good feelings about this. So, I mean, it's a very solid four out of five for uh, number, uh, sorry, uh, again, uh, number seven of Angel and Faith. Uh, moving on, so we have uh, we have Jennifer Blood, number 10, and <laughs> uh, we have the world's worst, uh, uh, we have uh, the world's worst uh, attempt to be like Jack Bauer, uh, with uh, Jack, the per, you know the perverted next door neighbor who now wants to be a uh, you know the uh, helper to uh, to Jennifer, and we have you know Jennifer her, essentially you know her mission is over, but she wants to uh, you know she wants to eliminate anybody who would still threaten her existence, if you will. And it is pretty direct with that. They want to uh, stop, you know, they, you know, people still want to kill her and she still finds people that need killing. But at the same time, we have, uh, you know, you know, we've got these cops that are after her. We've got the, you know, the, the, the parents of the ninjets that are also after her. And <laughs> it's just, you know, it's... Again, wonderfully, you know, it's, you know, it's basically, and I think I've said this before, it's Garth Ennis, I know he's not writing it because Al Ewing uh, is, is writing it now. Uh, the artwork here by uh, Cuber Ball, or Bal, however you want to pronounce that. Uh, it's a little bit off uh, the beaten path here, but it still works. I mean, it's, it's very good. And, you know, Al Ewing is definitely a... A superb uh, replacement for you know handpicked by Garth Ennis to to be writing this series. Uh, he's really excellent at telling the stories of you know the the life and times of Jennifer Blood, and ultimately we have uh, just all of the insanity and everything that you know. It's kind of like I said, it's kind of like uh, you know Garth Ennis's own take on if he had created the Punisher himself what would that character be like? It would be, it would inhabit more of an Ennis universe. Because Ennis, you know, the, his take on the Punisher ultimately became, once it came around to the Max titles, ultimately became deadly serious. Uh, when before, when it was just still in the regular Marvel imprint, and it was still interacting with the rest of the Marvel universe, it was more of a, you know, kind of a silly, uh, but not overly silly. You know, it didn't get to a point where it was like this, the just insanity of, you know, a man drinking, you know, uh, you know, urine with uh, bourbon and, uh, <laughs> and an egg, you know, <laughs> and this, you know, totally coked out, bizarre, you know, kind of Charlie Sheen-esque, uh, you know, just wacko. Uh, they seem to be tra training the next level of, uh, you know, the resurgence of the ninjets. And just everything that goes on in this title, it's it's wacky, it's bizarre, it's it's wonderful, it's it's just it's truly it, it's it's really a pleasure to read every every issue of this. It's it never it never fails to make me laugh out loud at least a couple times throughout the you know, throughout the issue. So I mean there's some really clever stuff going on here. Al Ewing very assured with his uh, taking up the, the reins from Garth Ennis here. So uh, because he's got big things to do right now. He's working on the shadow, so that, you know, to me, that's that's more of anything than anything that's coming up, pretty much. That's more of a big deal to me than any big event comic, such as, you know, Avengers vs. X-Men. Just as a for instance. Uh, so, on to, like, the ultimate in... Uh, uh, in... In independent work, and that is uh, Terry Moore's Rachel Rising, number six. Uh, again, this has been just uh, the strangest. Uh, it's been, you know, it's been one of the strangest reads I think I've 
read in a really, really long time, but I'm on board with every second of it. You know, it's just... I don't really understand everything that's going on here. There seems to be a lot of... Uh, but it's not all just exposition, and you know, it's not a lot of action happening. It's just the, the mystery just keeps on thickening and thickening and thickening. And we're no closer to the truth about why exactly Rachel did come back from the dead. Uh, and, you know, there are these really interesting conversations on the nature of death and, uh, you know, what it means to have somebody who is, you know, kind of, who is the living dead that's not, they're not a zombie or anything like that. I mean, this could have easily become something like that. But Terry Moore, in his wisdom, decided, well, okay, you know, there's probably just, there's way too much, you know, uh, you know, living dead shit going on right now. Uh, so it's time to move along and get to... Uh, you know, something that is more, uh, more off the beaten path, ultimately. And, you know, it, I, I've, and I think I've likened it to uh, a David Lynch film as well before. It really seems like this is, you know, it, it's almost like if David Lynch made a comic book, this is kind of what it would be like. You know, it has all of these very odd characters. It's populated by these very strange occurrences. Uh, it's it's just it's terrific. It's 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 a, it's a really good independent series and one of the few independent series that have really said I am really solidly into this. So, uh, as much as I didn't, did I actually? Uh, so Jennifer Blood, again, I'm sorry, was very solid. Four out of five, edging more towards four and a half. Same with uh, with Rachel Rising number six. Again, just terrific work. So. On to our picks of the week. Um, you, I'm sure you know they're coming. So we're just we're going to do this one. Then the next one we'll deal with uh, the main three. So this was kind of the runner-up for the week, and that is Winter Soldier number three. Now this is basically uh, we've got uh, you know we got Brubaker and got uh, Butch guys doing uh, you know laying on more layers to what exactly. Uh, uh, Bucky, you know, at you know, Bucky and Tasha need to fight. You know who exactly they are fighting with. You know, with the Red Ghost and with uh, Lucia von Bardis and and ultimately Doctor Doom here. And you know that uh, you know von Bardis actually. You know, there's mention, of course, of the secret war that just basically kind of predated the civil that basically predated civil war. And, uh, you know, uh, Von Bardis getting her hands on a Doom bot that essentially was a, uh, a program personality stand in, you know, both in personality and power, a stand in for Dr. Doom. And it's just, you know, it's just one of those things that's so, uh, it's so intricately planned. You know, you really feel like this is, you know, it's a, it's a great mix of spy adventure. Uh, or of, you know, I should say, spy thriller and superhero adventure. Um, you know, just with all of, you know, working with Nick Fury and, you know, all these kind of very underhanded things that are going on throughout the book that, you know, well, this person is being uh, blamed for this, but is actually doing this, Who, but, is, you know, that's just actually a smokescreen for them doing this. You know, I mean, the duplicitous nature of the spy world is very much at, at work here. Um, you know, I mean, the threats of, you know, the threat of the Red Ghost, the, the ultimately the break-in to uh, the Latvian embassy into Dr. Doom's stronghold, uh, obviously ignoring everything that's happening currently in FF or Fantastic Four, and that's okay because it ultimately serves this book's purposes. Uh, you know, certainly to uh, a very, you know, very similar dimension that it works there. But just, you know, this has been consistently has been just a terrific, great series. Uh, you know, uh, it's, you know, Brubaker's, it's the best stuff that he's doing right now in the Marvel Universe. So, um, uh, again, a very solid four and a half, leaning more towards five out of five for Winter Soldier number three. Very good artwork, just very ex just excellent storytelling all around. So 
We're going to be right back with our picks of the week. So stay tuned.